All right, let's pray. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the Day family and Abiding Ministries and Burton and his family and the work that they're doing. God, we, we haven't had the privilege yet to hear Burton's story as a church, but uh, Rob indicated it's an amazing story of your grace. And so we pray that you would bring about more stories like that through the work that Rob and Christy and Burton and their families are doing up on the Apache Reservation. Lord, you, you love people. You made people in your image to worship you and know you and find joy in you and to have their hearts be at peace and rest in you. And so we pray that you would use the ministry of Abiding Ministries to do that work in the lives of people up there. And Lord, we pray that you would use us to do that here, that we would be people who are constantly with all our lives in the words that we speak, in the way that we live, in the prayers that we offer to you, are constantly presenting people with the hope of Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you've seen fit to give us that hope, and we pray that we would be your instruments to bring that hope to others. We thank you for the body of Christ, and I pray this morning that as we look at what your word says about obedience to you and loving one another, God, that you would help us to walk in these things. In Christ's name, for his sake we pray, amen. All right, open in your Bible with me to 1 John chapter 5. This is our last chapter in 1 John. You know, if you read 1 John at home, it usually goes quick, but when you study it at church together, I guess it takes a half a year, and that's okay. I'm going to give you a warning. Uh, as we finish up 1 John, this last chapter, you're going to hear many of the same things that you've already heard as we've made our way through 1 John. And the repetition that we find in John's letter here makes me think of a precious story about the Apostle John that one of the early church fathers told us. And it's said that John, at the end of his life, was a, a very old man. He was living in Ephesus, and when the church would gather, some of John's disciples would put him on a pallet and would lift him up and would carry him into the gathered congregation. And they would hold him up above the congregation, and he would kind of lean up, and for a couple of minutes, he would teach, and he would basically say, Beloved, let us love one another. Love comes from God. You know, the same things that he says in his letter here in 1 John. And, uh, you know, some time would go by, a couple of days or whatever it was, the next time they would gather and they would do the same thing and John would say the same thing. Again and again and again, he would have this message for the gathered body of Christ. Let us love one another. Love comes from God. And I don't think it was because John was old or senile that he repeated himself. I don't think it was a lack of memory. And I don't think it was because the Christians that he was speaking to were daft and unable to gather or to keep the concept in mind, love one another, love comes from God. I think it's simply because we need to be reminded of these very simple but very precious truths again and again and again until God settles them deep in our hearts and they become a part of our DNA. Loving God and loving others is the very essence of the Christian faith. It's, it's difficult, but it's not complex. God is love, and where his love abides, love pours forth. And so it's imperative that we hear these precious truths repeatedly as God continues to mature and shape our hearts into ever greater Christ-likeness that looks like love. And so John repeats himself in this book. But it's not merely John. This is the wisdom of the Holy Spirit passing on to us the things that God knows we need to hear and be told and be taught. So let's read 1 John chapter 5, and let's read verses 1 through 3. John writes, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. 
All right, so verse 1 here is John basically plagiarizing himself from chapter 3, verse 23. If you want to look back there, he says, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Man, there's that repetition. I mean, it's not quite word for word, but it's almost the exact same concept. But this idea that John speaks of here regarding sort of belief goes actually all the way back to the beginning of John's letter. John told us at the beginning of his letter that he has written all of this so that we might know with confidence, so that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of mankind. So I want to talk about belief for just a moment before we get into the rest of this. Two things about belief that I want you to understand as we reflect on this for a moment. First, I want you to understand that belief, faith, the Christian faith that you hold to, is not contrary to reason. Faith is not contrary to reason. See, some Christians have been duped by this radical religion that our culture holds to today. The secularism, the religion of secularism. And that religion is science. And science builds itself as a worldview that has no religion, but the truth is science is a religion. It has its fanatical adherents, close-minded zealots who believe that the only thing that can actually be accepted is that which can be proven by empirical evidence. And they assert as one of their condemnations of Christianity that faith or belief in something that you cannot see or cannot prove is unreasonable. They would say that our faith that we believe is a system that's not built on any evidence. It's only irrational belief or unproven theories. And of course, they would say that condescendingly to us, like we're unintelligent or stupid or that we have our faith placed in something that has no reality or hope or truth to it. And John, of course, would simply laugh at this claim because John wants us to believe in the Son of God based on John's testimony, what John saw with his eyes, what John heard with his ears, what John touched with his hands. The life that John perceived Jesus live, a life of sinless perfection. The teaching that Jesus taught that was the wisdom of God. The death of Jesus that was exceptional in nature and the corresponding resurrection of Christ that was miraculous in power. These are powerful things for us to receive and to believe because John was there and he testifies and he tells us. But John would also want us to believe, as we've sort of seen woven throughout his letter, believe in Jesus Christ, not just because of what John saw in Christ and what he did, but because of what Christ does in the human heart, in an ongoing nature from day to day. This is, I think, maybe one of the most convincing modern proofs of Christianity. The way that faith in Jesus radically changes lives. Burton, would you testify to that? Amen. And my point here is only to tell you to be bold in your faith. Don't be ashamed when the religious fanatics of our day, those zealots of scientism, tell you you don't know what you're talking about because your faith is unreasonable. There are plenty of proofs that show that Christianity is true and real so long as you don't have a heart that's hard that refuses to see them. The second point I want to make here just about kind of verse 1 is much closer to the point that John is trying to make regarding belief. True belief in Jesus Christ has ingredients and it has results. The ingredients are what we believe. And the results are then what happens when we believe. So the ingredients of true Christian faith are a sincere conviction, like John says here, that Jesus is the Christ who's been born of God. He is the only Son of God who 
proceeds from the Father himself, who lived as a human. Jesus is already, or I'm sorry, John has already told us about this, that we must profess that Christ came in the flesh, that this Jesus died for our sins because we are sinners, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And once we acknowledge that Jesus is God, who did this work, we then look to him for rescue. Our belief is placed in him, not just as one who lived, but as one who rescues us through his life and death. And so as a result, we would repent of our sin and we would trust that his way is a good way. We would believe that following him is human life the way that human life should be done. And in true belief, real trust, we then would choose to believe in him, not just as a mental thing that we agree to, but as a life lived in obedience. Those are the ingredients. That's the what we believe. And the what we believe then produces the results of the Christian faith. What we believe makes something happen in us, deep in our hearts, in the core of who we are, in the central place of what it means to be a human. We believe God loves us. We see the proof in Jesus' death and resurrection to rescue us. And then as a result of that belief, that faith, something kicks in. It goes to work. Because God loves us and we've come to understand his love and we've received his love, we now become people who respond to God in love. We love him. And as a result of our love for him, we love all those who are in him. We love the other children of God, those born of him. John says, everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. And I want you to understand, this is the source of all true Christian unity in the church. You ever been to a church where it seems like the unity is the local football team? That's not real unity. You ever been to a church where it seems like the unity is, you know, the city that you live in? Maybe the things that you have in common, the hobbies that you share, your economic status, your race or skin color— That's not unity. Christian unity is through Christ. It comes from our shared love of God. And out of that love that we have for God, his love infused in us that pours out and connects us to all those other children of God who are born of God. The bond that we share in Christ, the bond that we have as Christians It is a bond stronger than even that of the subatomic particles that take one of those massive reactors to split into pieces. It is a bond that cannot be repelled. It's a bond that cannot be broken. It is a bond that keeps us together despite all of our differences. And this is what John means when he says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Now verse 2 begins to get very practical. What does the community of love look like in practice? What does God's love poured into us look like as we live in relationship with one another? John says, By this we know that we love the children of God, When we love God and obey his commandments. So love for God means that we practice obedience to God. As we've gone through 1 John, we've talked about this word a lot. Practicing. We don't practice sin. We practice righteousness. And in in particular, John wants us to know that this practice of obedience uh, is going to play itself out in our love for one another. Now, I think the commandments, John uses the word commandments. You might ask the question, like, what commandments? I think that John has in mind, in particular, the commandments of one another's that we find throughout the New Testament. 
So I want to go through these with you this morning, and I've put them up on a slide so you can kind of follow along and you don't have to flip around like a crazy person in your Bible. Romans 15, 7 tells us that we are to welcome one another. Welcome one another. I think this means we're supposed to be hospitable and inviting. I think it means that when we see one another, we should have smiles on our faces. I mean, I don't want to be cliche. It's not just about a smile, but a smile indicates that I'm actually glad to see you. I think it means we're to offer to one another a sense of belonging, a sense of embrace. I think it means that Christians are supposed to be relational initiators. Are you waiting around the church for other people to seek you out? Or are you welcoming one another, being a relational initiator? I think it means we're to show our love for one another like God shows love for us by seeking us out and inviting us in. Ephesians 4.2 says that we are to bear with one another in love. Our greatest example of this is Jesus himself. And we know the disciples, I mean, if you've read the, the Gospels, then you know that the disciples said and did many stupid things. I mean, I don't want to like insult the apostles, but in many ways, these guys were not the cream of the crop. And if there's that many that are recorded in Scripture, and the Gospels are short, and Jesus' ministry with his apostles, his disciples, covered three years, how many more stupid things did they say or do that simply didn't make it into the text? Now, we don't know. I'm only speculating here. But I highly doubt that over three years, Jesus, in his humanity, was not tested and forced to bear with these guys through many moments of disappointment, maybe we could say. But Jesus was so patient with his disciples. He was so slow to reach conclusions with them. Even the one that he knew would betray him, he never kicked him to the gutter. He was always willing to extend grace to them. And, and even if you reject my claim, like you're like, ah, Grady, there's, no, there's not enough information in the text to say this about the disciples. Okay, then what about you? Right? How many times has God had to put up with you in the way that you have disappointed him or mistreated him or failed him? You're a difficult person to put up with. But God has borne with you. He has stayed with you. He has, in love, remained committed to you. Now, I'm not here suggesting that we just put up with all kinds of sin in our Christian community. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm only saying that Scripture commands us to bear with one another, to be fiercely committed to each other, to in love bear the burden of relationship joyfully, consistently, through difficulty, through hardship and hurt feelings. Just like we're fiercely committed to Jesus, out of love for God, we are also to be fiercely committed to one another, out of love for God. Then Colossians 3.13 tells us that if somebody really wrongs us, if somebody sins against us, if it's difficult to bear with somebody, well, then we're told this, forgive one another. Forgive one another. Friends, I say this with some regularity, I think, in my teaching, but if you hang around our church long enough, somebody here is going to hurt your feelings. Somebody here is going to do something to wrong you. Somebody here is going to offend you. Somebody is going to sin against you. Stick around long enough in any relationship and eventually you're going to get hurt and you're going to get wounded, even among the body of Christ. And as Christians, we are striving to eliminate sin from our lives, but we are far from perfect. And with some regularity, unfortunately, we still fail one another. 
And if we say love, we love God, then we are under a powerful obligation to forgive those in the Christian community who sin against us. To forgive others in the same way that Christ graciously and repeatedly forgives us when we sin against him. Look again at verse 2 in 1 John. By this we know that we love the children of God when we obey his commands. God commands us to forgive each other. And if we can't find it in our hearts to do that, if we can't find it in our hearts to extend forgiveness to those in the body of Christ, then I would say that we neither love the body of Christ nor know the love of God that's been poured out on us. If you refuse to forgive someone, you're actually in sin against God, even as you're in sin against your brothers and sisters in Christ. Next, James 5.16 says that we should confess our sins together, or confess our sins to one another and pray for one another. So let's just do a show of hands. When was the last time? No, I'm kidding. If I did that, we probably wouldn't raise our hands. I mean, how often do we actually engage in obedience to the command to confess our sins to one another and to pray for one another? I think a lot of churches kind of stink at this command. We're either too afraid that people around us would get some dirt on us, that they might think differently of us, that they might no longer want to hang around us, or we're too self-righteous to admit that we actually engage in sin. And so we don't confess. And if we aren't honest, I think it's amazing that these two things are brought together, confess and pray. Because if we aren't honest about our sins with one another, how can we possibly pray effectively for one another? You can't pray for someone if they don't ever confess. But we're commanded to pray for one another and to be honest in our confession of sin. And in doing this, we show love for one another. Now look, I don't think we're obligated to like publicly stand up here on a Sunday morning in front of everybody and, you know, spill all the dirt. But do you have at least one or two Christian friends, a brother or sister in Christ that you feel like you can go to and just be like, man, I got to be honest. I'm struggling with this temptation. I'm failing in this area of my life. I've sinned against God. And will you extend God's forgiveness to me? And will you encourage me? And will you lift me up in prayer and pray that God would grow greater obedience and love for him and faithfulness in my life? And let's focus on that other piece for a second, this prayer piece. You know, confession to another person is ultimately meant to flow into a commitment to pray for one another. Do you pray for other people in our church? Do you pray for our church? I was encouraged a few weeks ago because uh, when we finished up our, our service here, we got to work cleaning and, you know, there's always an urgency to that. We have to be out of the building by one o'clock and there's lots to do. But I noticed at one point somewhere in the room, kind of out of the corner of my eye, a small group of people surrounding somebody praying for them. Man, that's so much, I mean, we need to get the work done to clean up, but that's precious. That is a powerful kingdom activity taking place at church. What a beautiful picture of the community of Christ loving others in our church. And our first instinct when we encounter somebody who confesses sin to us, who's struggling with sin, shouldn't be to be like, whoa, I should stay away from you. It shouldn't be to to judge or condemn them. If they're already confessing sin, there may not even be a need for rebuke. But we should immediately pray for them. Immediately launch into prayer. Scripture tells us the, that the prayer of God's children, are power, it's powerful and effective to bring about change. Next, Galatians 5.13 tells us that through love we are to serve one another. Simply put, this means that we need to seek to place others in front of ourselves as we go about living our lives. 
We look to the needs and interests of other people in our church and not only our own. We can look again to Christ as our great example here. If anybody had a right to place himself first, it was Jesus. He was entitled, literally entitled, to be first in everything. And yet, where did Jesus choose to be? He chose to be lowly and humble, to serve those around him, to consider the good and the needs of the people that he was interacting with. And a tangible and undeniable expression of love is simply serving other people. It's hard to deny that somebody really cares about you when they lay down their life to serve you. And if we love the body of Christ, then we're going to look for ways that we can do good to others by serving them. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says that we must encourage one another and build one another up. I think that the greatest way that we can encourage our fellow Christians is by pointing out and expressing to them the ways in which we see Jesus in them. Is that how you go about encouraging other people that are Christians? I think sometimes we might be afraid to encourage people because we think, well, if I say this, then I may give to them kind of a, a big head. I may, you know, make them struggle with humility. I may make them proud or I may, they may think that I'm giving to them glory that's only due to God. But look at the way in which Jesus encouraged Peter. Do you remember that moment when Jesus said to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, with much zeal, says, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God. And Jesus encourages Peter in an, in an incredibly unique way. He says, blessed are you, Peter, for God has revealed this to you. I think the way Jesus encourages Peter is by calling him blessed because he sees the fruit of God's work in Peter's life. He doesn't, in some ways, he doesn't even encourage Peter. He gives glory to God by pointing out the way in which God is working in Peter's life. Wouldn't it be wonderful in our church community if we were always encouraging one another by pointing out the way that we see and affirm God's work in people's life. You know, I think personally, probably the greatest encouragement that you can give to me is to simply say, man, G Grady, I see Jesus in you. And the way that you did that, the way that you said that, the thing that you did there, I, I just see Jesus in you. Because I, I don't want you to see me. I want you to see through me to see Christ. And what a beautiful way to just encourage one another, reminding each other that we are God's beloved possession. We're bought with the blood of Christ. We are his holy temple. We are filled with his spirit. We are his harvest producing a crop of righteousness. And beyond us is God moving and working, doing mighty things. And so we should constantly encourage one another. And the greatest encouragement we can offer, simply put, is to say, I see what God is doing in your life. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 5, tells us that we are to comfort those who are in affliction with the very comfort that we ourselves have in God. You may not know this, but right now people in our church are struggling they need some comfort. They need to hear from you the comfort that God has given you as you express it and share it and extend it to them. To them. That we would comfort one another means that we are a community where we offer hope and healing to those who are in our church who are suffering. You know, sometimes I think there's sort of like a an air of darkness or like a stigma that hangs around people who are suffering. And there's a time to be silent and to close our mouth and to just mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep. But I think often those who are in mourning and those who are in need of comfort are often sort of neglected by the church body. And we're supposed to listen 
to their difficulties with patience. We're supposed to be quiet. We're supposed to attend to them with a prayerful heart in patience. Weep with them. But then, after a time of weeping and mourning and silence, then we're to speak to them words of comfort. We're supposed to point them to the goodness of our sovereign God who loves them. We're supposed to remind them of Christ who died for them. We're supposed to remind them of the hope of the resurrection. We are to speak into that suffering words of comfort. Yes, we should be slow to speak, but we cannot stay silent. And at some point, we need to remind them Christ too suffered. And there's hope in his resurrection. Comforting one another, I think, means that we point one another to the peace that we have in Jesus. Not peace like the world gives, but a transcendent peace. We're also told in Galatians 6.2 that we're to bear one another's burdens. Oh man, you guys are going to bear up under my burden this morning. We got to get to 12. Galatians 6.2, we are to bear one another's burdens. This is different than bearing with one another. Bearing each other's burdens mean that we, means that we come alongside of those who are struggling. We offer them help in their time of need. Maybe it's a spiritual help. We bear their burden spiritually. We engage in extra prayer and extra encouragement. We take them to the scripture to remind them of what God has revealed to us. Or maybe it's material where we pool our resources together and we say, you're a brother, you're a sister. We're not going to let you go hungry. We're not going to let you lose your home. We're not going to let you endure this material difficulty, this time of famine alone. In any case, we are a body of believers. And Scripture says, where one member suffers, all suffer. And where one, me one member rejoices, all rejoice. And so we come together loving one another by doing whatever we can to lift this person out of their difficult circumstances, out of their suffering, and to present them to God saying, God, we appeal to your mercy together as a body on behalf of this person. Would you show them grace? Would you show them kindness? Next, Hebrews 10.24, we're commanded to encourage one another by stirring one another up towards love and good deeds. This means that we act like cheerleaders for each other. At various points, maybe somebody's heart isn't entirely in the game. And we want to get around them and we want to do the sort of rah-rah, you need to get back in there. Press on, keep playing. Play harder. Or maybe they're making advancement and they're growing in Christ-likeness and they're becoming more mature and we come around them and we say, we see growing maturity in you and we just want to cheer you on. Be inspired to love him more, to continue in the work that he's doing. Or it might simply mean, believe it or not, that we live exemplary lives where we can actually say to somebody in humility, look at my life. Let me stir you up to love and good deeds by showing you that the life that Jesus commanded his followers to live is possible and I'm, I'm walking in it and you too can walk in it and let's walk in this together. And if stirring somebody up doesn't work, then we may need to go to Colossians 3.16. Admonish one another in love or in wisdom. To admonish somebody is to warn them. Maybe it means to rebuke them. It means to remind them of the dangerous consequences of their actions if they continue in the direction that they're going. If you persist in displeasing God in this way, there will be consequences. And so we admonish, we warn, using the wisdom of God's Word, not, not our own ideas. We take them to Scripture and we say, here is what the wisdom of God says. And you need to put this into practice in your life. And I'm here as a brother or sister in Christ to walk with you in that. This means out of love for one another, we point out 
evidence in the lives of each other that suggests that the fire of love for God is growing cold. And we may even have to go so far, like I said, like the prophet Nathan did with David, to rebuke them and say, you are that man. Here's what Scripture says about disobedience to God, and out of love for you, I'm going to boldly say, you are that man. And we do it gently, we do it graciously, we do it with love as our motivator. We're not trying to beat people up, we're not trying to get on top of some dog pile to be better than others. But we should, as Christians, be proactive to take one another back to the Word of God, the wisdom of the Scriptures, to show our wayward brothers and sisters, here's what pleases God. And here's what a life lived in obedience to Jesus looks like. And and as Christians, we should actually be eager and we should be humble to receive from our brothers and sisters a word of admonishment. We tend to think that we that when you care about somebody, you just keep your mouth shut because you don't want to hurt their feelings. But if you really see somebody going down a path that is eternally dangerous dangerous for their soul and you don't admonish them with the wisdom of God's word, you do not love them. You don't care about them wandering into danger and self-destruction. And when we receive a word of admonishment, it might initially sting. It probably will. And it might take some time to digest and to get through the bitter taste. We are often proud and we are often self-deceived. And we are often unwilling to even hear a word of admonishment. But when a fellow believer courageously obeys God's command to admonish one another, and they have the courage to speak that to us, in love, praise God for their faithfulness. Praise God for their love that we would be holy and they would be eager to see us walk in righteousness. Finally, we can go back to 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, and we can simply be reminded that God commands us together to walk in light and not in darkness. And all of these prior commands tie in here. The goal of the Christian community is to be a city of light, a city of refuge. It's to be light in the midst of the darkness, together as a body for us to flee the sin of darkness, the sins that take place in the dark, where evil and sin dwell and hold fast to the light of Christ, to cling to what is good and right and lovely and true. John writes here in our text, chapter 5, verse 2, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love and obey His commandments. So let us be obedient to these things out of love for God and love for others. Let me close with verse 3. John writes, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Do you believe that? If God has truly changed our hearts and truly planted his love within us, then the natural result of that is that we begin to obey what God has commanded. And we spend our lives growing in obedience to him. It's a process, but we do that. And please understand, because lots of people mess this up, Please understand, we don't obey God so that we will then love Him. This order is very important. We do not obey God so that we will love Him. Rather, because God has loved us and transformed our hearts and placed within us a love for Him, given us a new nature in Christ Jesus so that we can walk in the way of Christ. We are going to, out of love for God, seek to do all that God commands. 
It's because we love God that we obey him. And while the world scoffs at us and says, man, Christianity, that's just a religion of things that you're not allowed to do. While the world scoffs at us and says, you have subjected yourself to a heavy burden of rules and regulations and shall nots, we understand what John means here. The commandments that God has given us, they're not burdensome. They're not heavy. They lead us to joy. They lead us to life. They lead us to freedom from shame and from fear. They're not a restriction on our freedoms. Rather, they set us free from slavery to sin and evil and ultimately death. Yes, putting to death the desires of the flesh, it's difficult work. It is a labor, but it is not burdensome. We recognize this work is our good. And we're deeply motivated by love for God to give him glory and honor. Because he's already given us his love. His commands are not burdensome. They're the words of life. And like the apostles said, where else would we go, Jesus? Where else would we go? Let me pray for us. Father, I just ask that by your spirit, by your power at work within us, that you would lead us in these commands. That our church community would be defined by these one another commands that you have given to your people. That like John says, because we love you and because we've received your love, that we would love those who are born of you. By your grace, by your spirit's power, we pray. Amen. <clears throat>